All right, okay. Uh, good morning, guys. Can you let me know if you can hear me and see a screen? Yes, no? Right, okay. So shall we wait for two minutes? Maybe others are also sent the link a little late. We'll wait for two minutes until everyone joins uh, and then start, okay? Okay, uh, right, we'll start because otherwise we'll run out of time. Uh, we'll go with 2015, guys. They'll do the papers, yes? No? Done, plastered, shape. Yeah, okay, so most of you all have, some of you all have looked at it, I guess. Okay, so we'll start with this. Uh, we'll go on now, guys. I'm not going to go into uh, very much in detail. Uh, into some questions because we have discussed these questions already, right? We have gone into uh, the basics, even in a MCQ and all, I would have discussed this. So I'm not going to go into very basics and, you know, teach everything from scratch, but, but uh, we look into it uh, from top, okay? So starting with 2015, uh, the first question says, distinguish between a pure public good and a merit good. A very simple question to start off with. You can... Go with, uh, you define pure public good. Remember when you're defining these pure public goods and all of it, you start off with, right, the characteristics. Say that a pure public good is non-rival and non-excludable in consumption, you know, then, then you can uh, say because of that, you can't charge a price, that, 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 generally provided by the government, okay? So you can put in those stuff for that, right? So definitions and stuff for that, for two marks, right? What a pure public good is. And then, a merit good, guys. A merit good is what, what type of a good? What does this merit good come under? That's one thing. What does it come under? Okay, positive externality. But uh, when you say pure public good, okay, public good, what is the opposite of a public good? Exactly, a private good, right? So a merit good, is also a private good, guys. Remember this, right? This merit and demerit, it's private goods that is broken down into merit and demerit, okay? So you can start off your answer. You can start off your answer saying, you know, merit goods are private goods, meaning that they are rival and they are excludable. So you start off with something like that and then say, then further, you can elaborate and go on and say, then, you know, uh, this gives positive externalities in consumption, and then it is underproduced, and, you know, you can give all this. So, other distinguishing features, okay. Public goods, you can say, it is uh, not provided by the market economy, that the market economy does not provide these at all. For a merit good, you can say they are underproduced. So, you start off with, you know, defining what they are, talking about this excludability rivalry, Okay, talk about the external part. Here you say it's not at all provided. Here you need to say it is under provided. So if you can give in an answer like that, I think it's a very simple one and you can get that done. So I'm not going to go into detail. I'm hoping y'all are okay with that. Guys, uh, don't put a table, guys. Never, never go and put a table. Please explain using a paragraph, right? In a paragraph format. For two marks, explain PO public. For another two marks, talk about a merit good. Okay. Now, uh, part two of this, explain using an appropriate diagram how the market system fails to allocate resources efficiently when production of goods entails external cost. Okay. So which diagram should we draw here out of the four diagrams? Which diagram? Telling us using an appropriate diagram show how the market fails to allocate resources efficiently when production of goods entails external costs. Okay, first thing, it's a production diagram, right? You need to draw a production diagram. And then what do you usually draw here, guys? When they say production of goods entails external costs, are you going to draw a positive externality in production? Or are we going into a negative externality in production? Which one? It's mostly a negative externality in production. So we need to draw a negative externality in production and we need to explain that. That is what we are trying to do. So they are asking us to explain using an appropriate diagram 
how the market fails to allocate resources efficiently in this negative externality situation. So all what you do is you draw the diagram, right? You draw the diagram and you explain. So you will have one uh, benefit curve, you'll have two cost curves, right? So which cost curve is higher? The marginal social cost is higher, right? In a negative externality. So this is, sorry, okay? This is higher. Okay, uh, hold on. Mm. Okay. Sorry, give me a second. Alignment issues. Okay. So, which one is higher? The marginal social cost is higher, right? Uh, yeah, I thought of going without Nvidia today. I think that's fine. Marginal social cost, and then which one is lower? The marginal private cost, right? So you then have to draw, you know, guys, I'm not going to teach you how to draw the, sorry, right? I'm not going to teach you how to draw the diagram and all of it. By now you should be uh, okay with how to, on drawing the diagram. So all what you have to do right now, when they tell you to explain a, a externality, right? So this can be a question that can come up in your exam as well. When they ask you to explain an uh, externality, right? Uh, overslip, not overslip. I woke by around 6.45, but yeah, I can say kind of overslip. Usually I wake up early for a BYC class. I uh, had some things to get done because I have a, a yeah, I slept all at around four, I'll say. Because I have a retract event at 9, not 9.30, 9.45. So I had to submit some reports before that. So I was up all night. Uh, right. Okay. Mm, where were we? Okay, here, this diagram. So on this diagram, right, now on your end, you draw the diagram. And then when they ask you to explain, right, explain how this market fails, guys, you need to show right you need to say okay this is the social optimum quantity but they are producing it right uh, you know they are producing it at this point so they are over producing it then talk about the price that they are charging so ideally you can say okay uh, this is the social optimum quantity right this is the ideal where marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit that is where they should be producing and the price they should be charging but actually what do they do the market ignores the negative externality market ignores the external cost here and they only produce and they only consume at this point so they are ideally over producing this and they're also charging a price that is too low okay so you can give in things like this case put in the diagram talk about whether they are over producing or under producing talk about what is happening the price that they are charging uh, in addition to that you can give in examples right you can give in you know examples for negative externalities in production for example, air pollution, right? Water pollution, there can be things like that, right? And then you can also maybe write a line about what the government can do in order to take it back to the social optimum level. You can say, you know, uh, they can impose a tax, right? To reduce production, they can put in fines for whoever who comes and let's say harms the environment. So you can put in small, small points like that, right? Here and there. There is no big explanation for pages and pages to write. But, you know, small things, small important things that you have to write. So these are, these are very basic question, right? You should be able to uh, handle it, but make sure that you draw the proper diagram. You put the wrong diagram, your whole question goes for a six. Yeah, that's question number two. Uh, then question number three, uh, proportional, progressive and regressive. I am guessing that you all are okay with this, right? We would have talked about this in uh, MCQ also. So what is a proportional tax? A proportional tax is where no matter what your income is, you pay the same tax percentage. You're not paying the same tax in rupee terms, but you're paying the same tax percentage. Now, for example, even when you're, uh, let's say, let's say if you're earning an income of 50,000, you're still paying 10% tax. You're paying, earning 100,000, you're still paying a 10% tax. That's a proportional tax. Then, uh, what is a progressive tax? A progressive tax is where when your income increases, you pay a higher percentage now. So 50,000, you pay 
on the thousand now you must be paying twenty percent, right? Maybe you can give in a small example also here in addition to the definition to prove your answer a bit more. And then for a regressive tax, what is a regressive tax? That is where when income increases, right, the percentage paid, right, as a percentage. Remember, always remember, not the rupee value. Okay, we don't talk about the rupee value here. We only talk about percentages. So as a percentage, the amount that we pay uh, decreases, right? So for three marks. All what you have to do is for one mark, define all of that. That is all that they ask you to. Okay, that. Uh, then, what is meant by excess burden of taxation? And show graphically the excess burden when a unit tax is imposed on producers of a good. Guys, what are they asking here? What is the question asking us? Exactly, the dead weight loss, right? So this is this is the same thing that we learn in unit number three. And so whoever who would have taught you all sometimes would have not taught you all excess tax burden in detail in unit number eight, right? Because this is the same thing in detail we talk in unit number three, the dead weight loss part. So what is meant by this? And graphically show it. So how do you graphically show it? When you have your normal, you know, you have your demand and supply, right? That's the demand curve. That's the supply curve. You have uh, equilibrium. When there is a tax, what happens, guys? When there is a tax, the supply curve shifts to the left, right? So there is a leftward shift of this supply curve. The moment it shifts to the left, guys, there is an excess tax burden that will be created. So which one is the excess tax burden? It's this theory. Yeah, right? So what does this excess tax burden mean? This is the loss of consumer surplus and producer surplus that is not received by the producer or the consumer. Okay. So, sorry, that is not received by the government. Now, if you all look at it, right, you all remember why did we call this dead weight loss in unit number three? In unit number three, okay, this entire part was called dead weight loss because the consumer is losing this area, right? He loses this area, this trapezium kind of thing. Then, if you look at the producer, he loses this area, this trapezium kind of thing. Guys, I'm not explaining in detail, okay, the tax diagram. I'm hoping you all know that. And, but even though they lose all of this, what happens is the government only gets this part, right? Only this box becomes government revenue. So this additional area, right, which I will try to use a luminous color here, right? I don't know, visible, visible, right? This additional area that consumers and producers are losing no one is getting it, guys. No one is getting the benefit out of it. So that is why we call that a dead weight loss. So that is what they ask you to explain. So when they ask you what is meant by excess burden of taxation, you can, guys, you don't have to memorize a thing. You can simply say the excess burden of taxation is where due to a tax, right, as a result of, you know, uh, the producers changing their decision, changing the decision in the sense now they're supplying less, no, right? Due to the uh, tax, since producers change their supply decision, in other words, since they decide to supply less, the loss of consumer surplus and the loss of producer surplus. Guys, I have sent the link only to one group. Is it really? Okay, I'm not sent it to the second group. Sorry. What is happening to me? Give me a second. Okay, right. Okay, so they'll come in. Uh, Lisa, there are people from group one and group three, right? I will not send it in second group. Yeah, I'll repeat the answer. Don't worry. Uh, right. Okay. So I'll repeat the thing again in very uh, simple, simple terms. Okay. I, I'll maybe explain what these small parts are. They can catch up. Don't worry. Right. 
So in this thing, okay, when they say excess tax burden, and to show it graphically, the graphical illustration is what we learned in unit number three, right? Simply supply curve shifting, uh, the dead weight loss. So what is this excess tax burden? Okay, so you can say, right? Yes, I'll I'll just try to put a few words, right? You can see what is there in the answer scheme also if you all want to, right? But in very simple terms, if I am to say this, okay, excess tax burden means this is a situation where Okay, when a tax is being imposed, the producer changes his supply decision. In other words, he, sub he decreases his supply. So as a result of this supply being decreased, the loss of consumer surplus and the loss of producer surplus is greater than the government's tax revenue. So consumers and producers are losing a lot, but the government is getting only a little. So a part of what the consumer and the producer is losing, right, as they are surpluses, no one is getting that. That is why you call that a deadweight loss or an excess burden of taxation, right? So there is people, parties who are losing, but no one is getting that. Guys, this is highly current unit number three, right? You don't have to know uh, unit number eight for this. And then you can explain that. So if you look at this, they'll give you around two marks for a diagram itself, right? To have a proper diagram and, you know, uh, explain everything. So step by step, you write guys. So you start off saying, okay, so when there is a tax put on producers, first, the supply shifts to the left or don't say shift to the left. You can say the supply decreases. The producers change their production decision. Then you can say as a result of this, what happens? An excess tax burden is created and then start explaining what is this excess tax burden. So if you can go step by step that way, I think that uh, question is pretty much okay, manageable. Yes, no, Chef? Question, problems, issues? Can handle, can't handle? Yeah, Chef, right. So then, uh, guys, if there's anyone who joined new, I'm very sorry that I couldn't send the link on the second group. I don't know why it did not go on the second group. Usually that doesn't happen. Uh, okay, so we discussed three questions, very basic, basic questions. Okay. Uh, one is pure public good and merit goods, the difference between that. Okay, so you talk about the features and talk about pure public goods not being produced at all. Merit goods are kind of underproduced. Then the second question what you need to talk about is a negative externality in production. So you draw the diagram. Now this one is a diagram here on this side of the screen. You draw it about, draw about the negative externality in production. And then uh, you talk about how the market fails, you know, fact that they are overproducing it, they're charging a price too low, right? You explain that story. And the third question is to define proportional progressive and regressive taxes. Again, very simple. You talk about proportional, uh, even if income increases, tax percentage remains the same, right? Progressive, income increases, the percentage of tax that they pay increases, regressive is the other way around. So you can put in that. And then we started this excess tax burden. So again, it's your unit number three diagram. So how is this connected to unit number eight? Guys, it is connected to unit number eight, guys. So because in unit number eight is where we talk about government uh, taxes and government this thing so the uh, which thing is this connected with this excess tax burden is connected to with a with a principle of taxation which which principle what is the principle this is connected with it's connected to a certain principle it's connected to this principle guys the principle of neutrality right so the neutrality principle says that there should not be an excess tax burden that when a tax is being imposed, that it should not affect the producers or consumers. This thing, yeah, you can call it efficient source, right? It should not affect the producers or the consumers' decisions, right? So, in this case, right? Okay, you, you can add those also to your answer if you want to, right? So, you can say an uh, excess tax burden is created when the tax affects the producer decisions. Remember, I told you. Because of the tax, the supply has fallen. It affected the tax decision. It is not neutral here. So when this neutrality principle is broken, that is where you have an excess tax burden. 
because if you if it's neutral it is not going to affect the demand and the supply curves the supply and the demand curves are not going to shift in that context so only if it is neutral there is no shift but the moment it is not neutral now there will be shifts in the supply curve right or oh, even the now if it's a tax on consumers then consumer demand curve will start to shift but we don't learn that in our syllabus so you can talk about neutrality and you can talk about all of that as well no problem at all okay again easy question 2015 uh okay so then the fifth one okay sri lanka's public debt appears to be more worrisome when compared to government revenue explain this statement guys this can be a question that can even show up somewhere in uh this year right when they talk about uh public debt and when they talk about all of this right so there can be things that come up okay because right now remember i would have given you all values right that the public debt to gdp has even exceeded 100 percent now and our revenue has fallen last year so you definitely can get a question like this. This is like a trend question. Okay, you need to put numbers and explain the story. You can't just say uh, public debt increased, revenue has fallen. This is bad for the country. No, that's like a bullshitting answer because that is given in the question itself. So when you're putting your answer, right? When you're writing an answer for a question like that, you need to give numbers, right? I have talked about these numbers over and over again. I would have shown you the central bank report. I would have shown you uh, different, different parts here and there. Right? So pick up some numbers, right? Debt to GDP. Yes, I gave you numbers, right? Was it someone else? Was it another batch that I'm talking about? I would have given you the numbers, no? These numbers from the central bank report. How much is debt to GDP in the recent years? How much is revenue in the recent years? Okay, in case I've not given it, go to the open the central bank report, right? It's there. Okay. So all what you have to do is do a little searching now. Rather than me spoon feeding you, do a little bit of Searching, I would have you maybe I gave it my fast track paper there, right? So these numbers now remember you can't go and buy heart and buy heart the answer in 2050 and go and write in 2021 now because those numbers that context is different to this year. Yeah, so central bank report 2019 or even 2020. You can take the latest numbers, you can write. So you put in numbers, you try to prove, you say, okay, expend uh, revenue has been this much. But expenditure has been this much. So we have a budget deficit. So given that we have a budget deficit, every single year we borrow. So our debt to GDP ratio is also now increasing. Guys, another reason why the debt to GDP ratio uh, in 2020 increased is because our GDP also fell. Because that is why it became now, if you all realize, right, the numbers, it was somewhere around 80%, right, 70, 80% debt to GDP. But all of a sudden in 2020, it went to, a hundred percent it exceeded 100 percent i can't even it's 105 or 103 somewhere around there so this is how you find the uh equation right this is how you calculate this thing okay uh 2019 will be more important but i would like to like if you all know 2020 as well right so in the context of 2020 why it got very bad is because now usually every year yes the debt increases but along with that the GDP also increases. So this percentage doesn't change much, right? Usual other years. If you compare and see 2017, 2018, 2019, that's how it worked. But in 2020, because of the pandemic, the debt also increased. In addition to that, this value, right? This value fell, the GDP fell. We had negative economic growth, right? In the year 2020. So as a percentage, this got very worse, right? Now, you can get questions from that area, okay? Because in our context, debt increased, GDP fell. So the debt to GDP ratio exceeded 100%. It went really, really bad. So go prepared. You need to support your thing with answers, with numbers. So when I say numbers, I would like you all to know these years, guys. 18, 19 for sure, right? But if you can put in 2020, because that is the latest year, that is where all of this has happened. So if you can give in numbers of this year, remember guys, the revenue as a percentage of GDP, the expenditure as a percentage of GDP, the budget deficit as a percentage of GDP, the what? Central bank debt as a percentage of GDP, all of those, guys, those are numbers that you definitely need to know, okay, right? I'm 
guessing some of you all would have made a short note it was your batch that i told you all right to take a day off and last class no i wanted you all to take a day off go through the central bank reports 2019 and 2020 ah last class no? if you have done that these numbers are nothing now for you right if you would have written that on your thing and maybe pasted on your wall simple context so remember guys question number 7 you're definitely going to get a question from numbers very very likely you should be lucky enough if they give you pure theory for all five sub parts very rarely they will do that every single year there will be one that will come from these numbers so go prepare yeah okay so that's 20 uh, 15 a levels okay we're done with that we'll move on to the 2016 one that's 2016 is one of the easiest questions and uh, that is where i went and wrote something crappy in the 2017 okay so 2016 okay so here they are saying what what the topics in the 10th question that they will be tested on 10th question 10th question i can't really say guys they can come up with anything right so i don't know if you're really preparing for the 10th question i'm guessing that you're not someone who is looking at an a here 10th question is okay you can write with your general con- uh, knowledge to pass but even as a teacher i will say 20, the 10th question is a question that i also might not be able to score 20 out of 20 because you never know what happens you need to your general knowledge has to be like expert expert on that area if you are to write the 10th question personal recommendation don't there are easier questions than that okay so 2016 uh explain how the existence of externalities lead to inefficient allocation of resources in an economy illustrate your answer with appropriate diagram so guys you can talk about all of the externalities right uh a negative externality a positive externality right production consumption because they are not saying which one exactly okay so uh this one right uh you can talk about it in general right you can talk about whatever that you want is yes, can you check the answer have they uh, put all four diagrams or have they put any one or two diagram can't remember the exact answer but you're free to put anything right because they're not saying that they put all four okay so on your end then you can also draw all four right and you all what you have to do is show why it is underproduced show why it is overproduced right that is the context that you need to do so simple question right you have a lot to write for that so i'm not going to explain guys all four diagrams i think we would have gone for all through di- diagrams uh if you put only two is it wrong i don't think they'll mark you wrong wrong but i think it would be now guys remember this right when they give you a question okay usually they make a question so that a student can do this in around 30 to 35 minutes okay so in that context now now this question there is a lot to write guys there are four different externalities four different diagrams now this will take time so in order to save time only now see the next questions they will make it easy see what are the objectives of taxation simply what you have to state uh, desirable properties of a tax mention so for example simply uh, uh, convenience flexibility uh, equity just mention right list the major components of recurrent diagrams so again simple things right salary then this thing just to list so now this question ideally now given that now this is a hint right i'm just telling you now your on your day of your a level you can't you don't know how the marking scheme is going to look like now right so you might think okay now this there are four diagrams if if i draw all of this will i waste time so what you need to look at is look at the next questions guys see how much you need to write in the next question so given that maybe if they say that you have to write only less in the next questions that means maybe this question is the question that you have to write a lot so because ideally a question is planned for around uh, you know a 30 minutes 35 minutes so it would be all right i think if you draw all four diagrams explain the four diagram that's fine so you can take around i will say uh, 10 to 12 minutes in this question even though it's a four mark you can catch up time from the other question so draw the four diagrams explain so that it is how it's underproduced overproduced right you can do uh that okay the motivational program i think yesterday was a good one but the only issue is at the beginning i think there was uh these right there were connection issues i don't know how many of you all were there but 
uh, that was a little irritating at the beginning, but then towards the end, it got better. He's a good speaker, though. Right? He was there for a previous one as well. Uh, yeah, there's a lot that we learned. Uh, it was good. He was a nice guy. How are your thoughts changing? Four marks, can we draw one diagram and explain? Uh, you, I don't think one diagram is going to be enough. I think you'll have to uh, go into more diagrams. Okay? Right. Okay, so question number two. What is a public good and why cannot markets easily provide such goods? Now, come on, guys. Now, this is easy, right? Public goods, you say non-excludable, non-rival, that, that, that. Okay? Uh, explain what is non-excludable. Explain what is non-rival. And then why can't markets easily provide these goods? Because they can't charge a price. Given that these goods are non-excludable. Non-excludable means even though you don't pay a price, even though you don't pay a price, you might not be able to exclude this person. You might not be able to make sure that this person uh, does not get that good. So because of the fact that it is non-excludable, people can't charge a price. So a market economy which focuses on profits, right? if they can't charge a price, they can't earn a profit from it. So that is why it's not easily provided in a market economy. That is why the government has to come in forward and provide this. So explain that story, guys. It's a very basic that you all can uh, look into. And then if you look at this, what are the objectives of taxing? Guys, what are the objectives? What do you think the objectives of taxation are? Objectives of taxation? Give me a few answers so I can at least I can copy and paste. Uh, no, it's not cost them anything in the public good. Externalities. No, we don't talk about externalities really in the public good. Okay, so objectives of taxation, right? Uh, we talk about, okay, to make sure there is fair to reduce income inequality. Yes. So you put progressive taxes. Uh, you can have, okay, efficient allocation of resources. So for any good that has a, positive externality, you might give tax concessions to improve the thing. Uh, anything that has a negative externality, you will give tax, uh, you will put taxes, so you reduce the uh, production, that's efficient allocation. Uh, then what else? Okay, to reduce BOP deficit, nice, you can say, talk about tariffs and all of it, right? If you put taxes on imports, which your objective is to reduce the BOP deficits, um, Okay, discouraging consumption of demerit goods. Okay, fine. You can put in, so that can be connected to point number three, uh, point number two here also. Mm, minimize uh, for economic growth and development. Okay, you can talk about government revenue. Okay, to affect over aggregate demand, to control aggregate demand, to raise government revenue, because otherwise, where are you going to get the money for all the government expenditure? So you can put in some points. Other uh, answers also, which I did not uh, talk about mainly, right? Uh, you all can write. So to earn government revenue, different, different things, other things. Okay, so to earn government revenue, you can put in things like this. Six control imports, that is to reduce BOP deficit. So here you can say uh, control imports. Yeah. Uh, to reduce this thing. So cyclical fluctuations in the sense uh, that you can connect that with effect over aggregate demand. Okay. So you can put in your points like that. Simply the objectives or why do they tax? An easy one. Then if they ask you the desirable properties of a tax system, guys, now they simply ask you to mention. You don't have to explain. You don't have to do all of that. So by now, I think you all should be able to answer this for God's sake. Uh, you know, equity, flexibility, uh, neutrality, uh, but being cost efficient, right? Uh, what else? Certainty, right? Simplicity, uh, convenience. Put the whole of that, right? That is what you have to do. Mention the properties, okay? Uh, if they tell to explain, yes. Uh, Anna, here, yes, look, I don't think, yeah, has the answer explained the points? I don't think you have to. No, right? Because they've said mention. So when they say mention, state, what, you can simply write points. You don't have to go and uh, in detail put the thing, right? Uh, horizontal world liquidity, I'll come there, right? I'll come into maybe after the class, okay? So that's the desirable properties of a good tax system. 
uh, yeah, if you write four, it's enough, guys. They'll give you one mark each. Maybe if you are not sure, write eight. Or a little bit more, that's fine. But I think for four, they should give you four marks. Okay? Right. And then the fifth one, uh, list the major components of recurrent expenditure of the government of Sri Lanka. So what are the major components, guys? We look at what are the big parts. Okay, so you have expenditure on goods and services, right? So you have interest payments, right? Uh, interest payments on public debts and all. Okay, interest payments. Then you have uh, transfer expenditure. So if you want, you can break this down, guys. So inside, uh, so transfers, you can say uh, what? Pensions, some of the benefits, right? You can break this down. Pensions, some of the benefits, fertilizer subsidy, okay? So you all know the components. And then you can even break this down, expenditure on goods and services, okay? right? So under expenditure on goods and services, what are the major components? What do you have inside this, right? What is the biggest component inside this? Hmm? It's salaries and wages. Hmm? Salaries and wages. So likewise, guys, you can give in components. That's all that they're asking. Again, they're not asking you to explain here. They're just telling you to list the major components. So when they say list the major components, you simply write points. You don't have to go and explain, you know, in big terms uh, what is happening and, you know, all of that, whether it has increased or decreased or uh, what are the problems with uh, interest payment. No not needed right you simply put points down that is one of the easiest easiest questions for unit number seven in a level paper right the 2016 one and looking at this that is why i decided okay i'm somehow going and writing the 2016 paper in my level paper right so in the 2017 paper so i also thought okay fine yes everything was theory and everything was uh, very very direct so given said that, I decided, okay, I'm also somehow going and writing this. But then the thing that you did not, that I did not see is one year when it is easy, the next year it is going to be a little harder, right? So the next year, the question that came wasn't that direct, wasn't that easy. Uh, hold on. Okay, so now this is the, why we have a diagram in the middle? Okay, okay so I... My alignment has gone for a six. Hold on. Okay, so this is the 2017 paper. Right. Uh, okay, so 2020 is also easy. Then your 2021 can be a little hard. Okay. Okay, hold on. This board sometimes goes crazy. Mm, okay, so this is the 2017 paper. But if you look at it, okay, now, first few questions are okay not hard, right? So 20, uh, on. Okay. So the 2017 level paper, they start off with this, right? Now you can't say, guys, no, they are not going to make the paper very easy because then the standard of the paper is gone, right? So then they will not make it easy, easy. I can't say that, uh, you know, given the situation that the paper is going to be easy because then the whole standard of it is gone. Everyone is going to, score high so that story is there so be careful okay then this one okay what is a public good now i'm not going to explain guys and how does it differ from a cost public good so all what you have to do is explain put in some examples also explain using the features right non-rivalry non-excludable that excludability rivalry features right put in those explain those simple thing not going to talk too much then why does a free market overproduce goods with negative externalities? You simply draw the negative externality diagram, right? So when they say free market overproduces, you can talk about the what negative externality in production. You can draw that diagram, right? So explain that, show how they are overproducing it. Now remember, I think in 2015 also we did the same diagram, right? So draw the diagram, say that they are underpricing, say that they are overproducing, right? All what you wrote for the 20. 15 paper is the same thing that you write in this paper. So those two questions are kind of okay. And then comes a little bit of a disaster here, right? So what are the major sources of excise tax revenue in Sri Lanka? Now, we don't go into details of, we don't dig deep into excise tax, right, in our syllabus. So what kind of examples do we have, guys? What are the major sources? Okay, so vehicle, petrol, cigarette, alcohol, 
Yeah. So these could be the answers, right? So you have these kind of things on vehicles, right? On uh, petroleum, right? On tobacco, that is cigarettes, and then liquor and stuff, that is alcohol. So those kind of things can be your answers. Now, this is not a thing that you generally learn. That is why I'm saying it's a little bit harder, right? You don't dig very deep into this. So, okay. So you can put in uh, four like this if you want to put this here itself. Right? You can put in something like that. Done. And then, now see, they are just asking you what, right? You don't have to go explain and talk about vehicle taxes. How is it going to affect ten uh, taxes on cigarettes? Why is it going to happen? No. Right? So those kind of things are there. Okay, so now, uh, an excise tax is idly put into a discouraged consumption, right? So on vehicles also, you can say that, right? Now, it's an import duty also. You can put in something like that, no problem. Whereas what are the other examples the textbook, not textbook, the past pay book has given? What is it this for the past pay book gave? Yes, remember, an excise tax is a tax put to discourage consumption. So for vehicles also, Yes, it's an import duty, but in another way, you can call that an excise tax also, right? Then petrol, right, to try to reduce the consumption because try to make people move into maybe electric vehicle. Now, cigarette and alcohol, the story is very clear, obvious. Okay, that. And then again, they come into this, this one, right? Now, this is also another question that I went very prepared with, right? Sri Lanka's public finances are at a perilous state. Guys, perilous means it's a bad state, right? It's at a worse state. Now, again, can be a question in your year also. Now, they will not give you the exact sentence, right? So identify the major weaknesses in public finance. So guys, when you say public finance, we're talking about everything. We're talking about uh, revenue, right? We're talking about expenditure. And you can also talk about the debt. Right? So, all what you have to do is you need to talk about the weaknesses in this. Now, if you take uh, Sri Lanka's revenue, what kind of weaknesses do you think you can find? In the revenue system of Sri Lanka or whatever thing. What can you find? Okay, first of all, you can start off with giving a percentage, right? As a percentage of GDP, this is only this much. Now, if you connect to the year 2020, right? So you can say that, you know, uh, VAT and all, those were the high, those were the high uh, revenue earning things. But in the year 2020, because of COVID-19 and all of it, we couldn't do all of that, right? So our VAT went to third place, right? So you can highlight facts like that. Okay, then okay. Mainly focused on indirect taxes. Now, excise duties, Yes, income tax is a direct tax, but excise duties and VAT, that composes a major portion of the tax. So that is also can be a problem. Then yes, higher cost to collect the government revenue. Okay, there is a high cost to go collecting government revenue. You can talk about uh, the tax compliance in Sri Lanka is very low, right? You can talk about, uh, let's say, there is a lot of tax avoidance that happens, right? People don't pay, okay? So you can talk about all of that for revenue aspect. Why is the revenue bad? And you can talk about uh, no proper source of non-tax revenue, right? Yes, tax revenue is somewhat okay. But our non-tax revenue is very low, right? So you can put those points. That can be for the revenue aspect. Then for the expenditure side of it, right? Okay, uh, here you can talk so much, right? You can talk about the interest payments. You can talk about the rigidity in this because you can't avoid this. Now, interest payments cannot be avoided. Salaries and wages cannot be avoided. Pensions cannot be avoided. The moment you start uh, changing these, people are starting to go to the road. So you can't avoid this. So it's rigid. That means you can't change. Okay. And yes, state-owned enterprises go on the losses. So government has to fund those expenditure. And you can say, you know, uh, with, uh, let's say, the currency depreciating, the interest payments that we need to pay keeps on increasing. Okay. So you can talk about, you know, a lot of bad sides on this. And then on the debt side of it, right? So here you can, you know, combine the two of this and you can say, right, because of, you know, expenditure being higher than the revenue, we have a budget deficit. Budget deficit means every year our expenditure is more than the income. So every year we need to borrow. So every year we are borrowing means our public debt is increasing and increasing and increasing every single year. 
So talk about put some numbers. Say depth to GDP in this year was this much. This year it was this much. The more more depth we have, you know, the let's say uh, more money goes out of the country. There is uh, exchange rate is uh, negatively affected because when we take the loan, yes, it's good. But when you're repaying, you're paying with interest. You're repaying, you know, the capital also. There is a lot of monetary outflow that is bad. You can talk about, you know, uh, then when there is debt, uh, the um, government tends to borrow from, you know, uh, this debt is accumulated by domestic and foreign sources. Now, when they borrow from domestic sources, it can lead to a crowding out effect, right? So you can talk about a lot of things like that, right? Different, different weaknesses and different stuff. So guys, for these kind of things, have an answer prepared, right? Now, these kind of things are probable questions in your paper. So take some time, right? Now, these, all of it, is they are in the central bank report when you now they will not directly put a heading saying weaknesses in revenue right but when you're reading the central bank report you can see they are highlighting a few issues they are saying okay this is what is happening this is what uh, you know they have been doing so those kind of things can be put in. so then the next question right again uh, connected to question number four now they're saying state briefly state huh? not you don't have to explain explain the important measures taken by the government in recent years to address the critical issues. What and what do you think the government has done, guys, in the recent years to make sure that, you know, these uh, things are kind of solved or these things are addressed? What kind of things has the government done and what have they uh, looked at? What do you all think? What has the government done? Selling lands to foreigners, okay, not really. So you can you can put this, right? Well, let's word it nicely, right? Uh, let's look at private-public partnerships, right? So this is one, okay? Private-public partnerships. Because what is private-public partnership? This is where the government, they get in touch with these private firms, okay? To invest, to come up with different things. So uh, because government does not have all the money, they do things, kind these kind of things. What else do you think the government have done? Okay, okay. So you can say uh, focusing on getting loans from non-inflation resources. Okay, fine. We're not a very big solution, but that's fine. What else have the government done? What have they done to you know address address these issues? What have they done to you know? So you can talk about revenue side, guys. On the revenue side, they have, you know, uh, there is a lot of restructuring that they have done, right? So tax restructuring, they have, uh, you know, made a few uh, different changes to the tax system, right? Uh, you know, they have come up with better software, better, you know, yeah, try to make the tax collection process more efficient. So you can talk about those, right? tax restructuring and improving efficiency of the tax collection process. Okay, you know, here you can cook up answers, right? Improving efficiency of tax collection. What else? What else do you think the government would have done or looked into? other stuff privatization they have not gone into privatization really that's not i don't think in the recent years they privatized anything so i don't think that could be an answer answer uh trying to maintain inflation at low level i think that is not again a thing there but then okay so you can talk about guys these things uh Okay, nothing is coming to my head also. Guys, anything kind of just let me know what does what the answer scheme say? We'll see if it is if it is applicable for the current years. Uh encourage tax compliance and expand the tax base. Yeah, so that, that all of that comes under this. So tax restructuring, improve the efficiency, right? Okay, so I'll copy and paste that if you want to, right? It can't be two points. Uh trade agreements. Mm, not really, really government trade agreements maybe for a unit number nine question 
you would have talked about, right? But in this context, I'm not very happy with the trade agreement answer. Anything else, guys? Anything else that the answer scheme has told and which is not really here? Any? On private public partnership? Yeah, guys, this is the main thing, right? Remember? Now, now, for example, if you look at Port City and all of it, these are private public partnerships, right? So we have not, uh, what? It's like a partnership with the Sri Lankan government and a private some organization in uh, China, right? Uh, it's not really privatization, guys. Privatization is where you sell a government owned thing to the private sector. So, not that. Uh, okay, encourage more exports. Mm, okay, tariffs to discourage imports so you can yeah, increase tariff revenue. But then that is not really, that's not really public finance. That's more into BOP. That's more into the current account part of it. Don't go very deep into unit number. Uh, this thing, unit number, let's say 9 and 10, because that might not be applicable sometimes. Okay. So you can write things like this, guys. But remember, pu private public partnership is the main thing. On your case also, I would like if you could uh, Google this, right? Uh, learn a little bit more on private public partnership in case they give you a question. You never know. Okay. Okay, well-planned policy for recruitment of the public sector. Okay, yes. Yes, and also, one more thing, all of these answers are there in the Central Bank Report, now, huh? Right, so what has the government done? The measures they have taken, open the 2020 Central Bank Report or the 2019 Central Bank Report. Okay, it's directly there, right? The measures taken by the government in order to, you know, re restore fiscal discipline or something, it's directly there. So that's where the Central Bank Report kicks in. Uh, GSP Plus, not for this, ideally. Uh, it's the... Yes, there is this fiscal policy chapter, right, in the central bank. I can't remember the chapter number. But there is a policy, there is a chapter that says fiscal policy and something. Yeah. Fiscal policy or government revenue and taxes or something. This read guys, you should be able to find it out. That's an easy chapter, easy to find. So go through that. That has everything. Okay. Foreign and direct investment, again, not really into public finance. I would like that into maybe a BOP question. Okay. Strengthening and wanted in the process of state-owned enterprises to minimize losses. Yeah, all of those can be taken into consideration. So now in your context, guys, the answers that we did in the 2017 answers will not be the 2021 answers because in 2021, they would have done different things, guys. Right? So... 2021, you have to get for the 2020 central bank report. So be very careful with uh, questions like that. Don't memorize answers and go because it's not the same. When you talk about trends and, you know, when you talk about questions like that, what happened in 20, this thing is not the same thing that will happen in another year. Okay. So be very, very careful. Uh, then moving on to the next one on the 2018 context of it. What do we have? Now, now ideally 2018, now compared to if 2017 was hard, 2018 should be a little easier, right? So that is how we'll see, right? You can't really, really say, right? It will be a little easier. I'm not saying it's the easiest one, but comparatively, it will be easier, okay? Right, give me a second, hold on. Okay, okay, malpractice, yeah, you can say something like that. Okay, so this is the 2018 paper. Now we'll see if uh, this is this thing, right? So 2018 A level. Okay, not very easy again, right? Okay, first of all, starting off with determine whether the following items are private, public, or common resources. Guys, can you give me answers? Uh, this thing? Fish in the ocean, common resources, right? Uh, broadcast television signals, it's a public good, right? No one is getting affected. Even uh, what mobile phone signals, public good. Okay, so this is public. Uh, basic research on lifestyle and cholesterol. So this is knowledge, right? Research and stuff is knowledge. So just because one fellow is doing research, there is no issues like that. Okay, so this is knowledge. So public, uh, yeah, you can say global public 
also but then since they have not said global public key just go with public ne a uh, specific research on cholesterol lowering drug for which patent can be obtained that can be a private one right so that can be a private one because specific thing uh, not everyone can get access excludable right uh, if you get a patent and all right so it can be a private could can you see but the interesting thing is they have not given very direct ones they don't ask direct ones you know all the, now these examples are not usually examples you might find in a tut or something right so not very direct that's the way that they're trying to turn things around okay then if you look at the second part of it how do you justify government intervention in a free market okay so how do you justify how do you try to say that there needs to be government intervention in a free market okay so in simple terms they are also asking you about the role right the government's role so this yes, the way of identifying is by uh, going with the characteristics right excludability rival okay so you go with the role guys what does the government do why do you now they are the question in directly they are asking you why should there be a government intervention in a market economy so to justify to say yes there should be right so you talk about the thing what we talked about before guys i think we started off the entire discussion last class with all of this right coefficient allocation to minimize uh, what economic to minimize disparities in income distribution right price stability okay so put in all your answers guys protect the environment for economic growth okay so put in answers like that i'll just copy and paste a few answers guys uh, establish economic growth and development maintain fair income distribution resource proper allocation of resources so you can put in answers like that that is why you need government intervention okay macroeconomic stability okay so all what you're trying to do here is you're trying to uh justify this uh right okay mm, to provide consumers with fair products yeah okay all same question they are asking you little indirectly right so don't think too much that and then this one question number 3 okay since there was a question also on the chat box distinguish between vertical and horizontal liquidity guys what is vertical liquidity vertical liquidity means people at higher income levels they have to be paying a higher proportion of tax now let's say you are a very rich person you are earning 500000 a month and i am only earning 100000 a month so it is not equal equal if both of us are paying the same tax so vertical liquidity means higher income earners and guys i'm going to just write in short time okay so vertical equity is where higher income earners earn a higher percentage right so higher income higher income earners they earn a higher percentage sorry not not earn right high income higher income earners pay a higher percentage okay so that's horizontal liquidity making sure it's fair then what sorry vertical liquidity then what is horizontal liquidity okay so horizontal liquidity means that people with okay nice thankful yeah so how do you ensure vertical liquidity vertical liquidity is ensured by having a progressive tax system right so to make sure there is vertical liquidity only government puts in progressive taxes okay so what is horizontal equity there was a perfect answer on the chat box so i'll just copy and paste is my uh, answer might be incomplete okay on top but remember the explanation don't just try simply blindly write what i write, put on the board right so horizontal equity is similar level of income earners should be similar tax rates so now for example let's say all 54 of us here are earning the same income then i can't be a person who is paying a higher tax not fair right horizontally everyone at the same level of income pays the same tax rate okay vertical equity is where the rich pay a much higher yes vertical equity main purpose is to make sure that the rich gets rich uh spends more right so high income earners pay a higher percentage of tax income earners 
pay a higher percentage. So that's simply vertical equity and horizontal equity. So you can dig deep into it, come up with an answer. Okay. Done. Uh, what is tax source? Okay, guys, tax source means uh, things like this. Now, for example, uh, the source for income tax is income. Uh, for VAT and stuff, it's goods and services. For property tax, it's property. So tax source means what is being taxed. You know, what exactly what is subjected to the tax, right? So the income is a tax source. The consumption of goods and services is a tax source. Your property or your uh, assets sometimes is a tax source. So what is being taxed is what is tax source, right? That. Uh, question number four. Why do some economists argue that budget deficit contribute to increased rates of interest and reduce private investment? Okay, these are crowding out effect. Can I explain that in BYC? Yes. I would have. Maybe in an MCQ. When the government borrows, this is what happens. The whole crowding out effect story. That okay. So in simple terms, I'm not going to type type. So listen carefully. Okay, what happens for all of this? Okay, so in case you all have forgotten, okay, there are a few yeses. That means a few of you all would have forgotten. So what happens is, guys, why does this budget deficit lead to interest rate increasing and private sector investment falling? Yeah, listen carefully. Uh, okay, I'll type also. Right. So what happens is when there is a budget deficit, right? So budget deficits, they lead to borrowing, right? So when there is a budget deficit, that means the government's expenditure is much more, right? So in, it increases, okay, domestic borrowing. So government has to borrow now, right? So they borrow from commercial banks, they borrow from the central bank, right? Right, they do all of that. So when they borrow from market sources, like, you know, commercial banks and all of it, okay? So the demand for, the money, right, increases, right? The demand for loans increases. Now, the private sector also wants uh, money for their investment. The government also has a budget deficit. They are also wanting money. So the demand for uh, loans increases. And then what happens? Because of this, because now everyone is fighting for loans, right? There is like a shortage of loans here, guys. The demand is high, but the supply is low. So shortage of funds. There is a shortage of funds in the market. So as a result, what happens? This shortage of funds, it drives up the interest rate. So interest rate increases, right? Interest rates increase. So what happens over here then? When interest rates increase, right? Investments, right? Private sector investment. Come on, now you have to pay a higher interest rate, right? There's a shortage of funds available as well. So investments tend to fall. It's crowding out effect and all of it. When you study at a degree level, you will go into very depth, right? Sometimes right now what we are teaching is utter rubbish for crowding out effect. So I will study that in more detail uh, if you all study econ further. Okay, so that kind of thing is what you need to explain. I just put in the points, you explain the story. Okay, done. Uh, do you work at CSE? Guys, I don't work at CSE. If I work at CSE, I will be working at CSE. Right, question number five. Uh, the government debt to GDP ratio still remains very high when compared to other years. Outline briefly the measures taken by the government to ensure sustainable debt level in the medium and long term. Again, directly is there in the central bank case. Okay, so debt to GDP ratio is high, right? Uh, we do have a lot of debt, but our GDP is also kind of decreasing, so debt to GDP ratio is increasing. So what kind of things has the government done? What do you all think? What are the measures that the government has taken to ensure sustainable debt? This, this is directly the central bank report. Huh? Measures taken by the uh, government for these, these things. What do you think? What kind of thing? Yes, can you all put in some answers so I can copy and paste some lazy type? What can they do? Okay, so again, here also, guys, you can put the private public investment, right? So, right? So rather than borrowing, rather than borrowing and spending, right? They can go into private public investments. Okay, can be a, a thing that you can talk about. What else can you talk about here in this context? What has the government done? 
Any answer? Increasing interest rates? Mm. To maintain this thing. Have, have they given that as an answer? Okay, restructure the tax system. Okay, that's fine. Okay, to reduce to increase income. Okay. Restructure the tax system. You can talk about this. Fine, no problem. But what else can we talk about? Please answers. I'm waiting for answers. What have they done? Yes, you can all talk about these guys now. For example, right now, this comes with the central bank report. They would have done uh, different, different things, right? Now, for example, the tax changes they have done, they have introduced this new tax. Uh, they have uh, changed this tax percentage. They have done this to the tax, right? All of that is directly there in the central bank report. So you can come, you know, uh, they have, you know, value added tax, they have done this. Income tax, they have done this. Uh, those kind of different, different things uh, they would have done. So, okay, yes, uh, transferring state-owned business enterprises to enable them to operate commercially, fine. Yes, you can talk about that's like more like privatization, but not privatization, privatization. Uh, you can talk about what else? I'm thinking what they have done recently. Mm, medium and long-term sustainability. Yeah, okay, rationalizing of expenditure. They, had, they came up with something called zero-based budgeting and stuff like that, right? Uh, different stuff like that. Then revenue-based fiscal consolidation was something else that they came up with. So different, different things, guys. Now, again, I want you all to, right? Please, please, please. Guys, uh, SOB means state-owned business enterprises. Okay? So, please, for God's sake, right? If you're planning to write this question, okay, please make sure that you go through, right? The central bank report, right? The 2019-2020. Right. So in the 2019 one, you can get the 2018 figures. In the 2021, you can get 2019 figures. So I, maybe at least the 2019 report from the 20, sorry, 2020 report. From that, you can get the 2019 figures also. Right. So go to the 2020 central bank report. They give you two years, two, at least two or three years values they give you. So you can see, guys, this is directly given. Okay. These are spoon fed in the central bank report. So you all need to go through that. If you're not going to go through that, writing this question or scoring the full mark here is not going to be an easy one. Yes, introducing new ideas. Now. So maybe that year, maybe they have done that. I am not very sure in 2017 or 18 if they did that. But yes, so maybe you can talk about this, that there is this thing, no, Ramish or something, the revenue uh, administration management information system that uh, taxes and everything, right? So maybe they would have done that. So different, different things you can talk about. Yes, now again, now this question also, even though I thought it would be easy, I don't think it was that easy. It was manageable, but not easy, easy. So maybe then, I don't know, the upcoming year, we'll, we'll guess, right? We don't know. Uh, okay, we'll see if the 2019 question is easier. Comparatively, the last two years, that is 17 and 18 was a little hard. Okay, so maybe 2019 could be easy. Right, so let's see how the 2019 paper goes. Hold on. Mm. Okay, we have two more papers. Guys, did anyone try the 2019 old one? No, right? No, okay, so I'm skipping that. Okay, if there's any, okay, we'll see if we have time, we'll look into that, but otherwise, I'll just skip that. Okay, I think the answer scheme is there in whatever my Google. Uh, document. Okay, so 2019 year levels. We look into this one. So we start off with um, okay. Mention four functions of a government in a mixed economy. Guys, in a mixed economy, uh, the moment the government comes and intervenes into a market economy, it becomes a mixed economy kind of, right? So again, when you talk about the four major functions, same thing, right? Um, yeah, improving resource what? Allocation, minimizing income disparities, uh, macroeconomic stability, right? Uh, promoting economic growth and development. Okay, so those are the major four functions. Okay, some the same thing, right? Remember, same thing. Now this is like the fourth, fifth time that they're asking you what is the government doing. Okay, repeated. 
And then what are the obstacles to achieve an efficient allocation of resources in a market economy? What do you think? Uh, this is the whole syllabus. No, right? This is the new syllabus, right? I don't know which one I copied and pasted. Guys, hand up. Rama, let me know if this is the old syllabus. Right? I think it's a new one. No? New one, right? Yeah, yeah, new one. Right? Okay, so what are the what, what do you all think the answer for this is? What are the obstacles to achieve efficient allocation of resources? Okay, so existence of externalities. Fine, yes, you can give that as an answer. What else? Why don't you have efficient allocation of resources? One is because of externalities, but what are the other reasons? Right? Okay, so public goods, yes. Uh, so obstacles is the, uh, you can talk about, okay, imperfect information. You can talk about uh, non-excludability of public goods. So because non-excludability, then it's not provided. So yes, non-excludability because of non-excludability. So you can talk about all of those guys, right? Factor, okay, factor immobility, non-optimal consumption of quasi-public goods. So this thing, right? They are, indirectly, they are asking you, what are the reasons for market failure under efficient, uh, inefficient allocation of resources, right? So it's a simple question, things that we know, but what are they doing? They are asking this in a different way. Hey, don't put macroeconomic instability into this, right? Because uh, yeah, they're asking you efficient allocation. No. Now, macroeconomic instability is a total uh, different point, right? Uh, income disparities is a total different point. So don't put that into this. So in this, maybe you can talk about uh, public goods and, uh, you know, over providing these externalities. So public goods are not provided. Uh, what? Some goods are, you know, not optimally consumed. Yes, monopoly situations, right? So you can talk about all of those things. Uh, I don't think they are looking for an explanation here because they're looking at what. You can give a small explanation if you want to, right? So uh, you can put in a small... Yes, recording of this, maybe within a week, I'll try to uh, put it into YouTube. So since this is the last class, the complete set I should have with me, I need to find that in my computer. Uh, it should be there somewhere. So I will put the all of these recordings, right? I'll put it into the Google Classroom, not Google Classroom, into YouTube. Right, so you all can watch that. Unit one to seven is already there. Unit eight will be uploaded before next class, ideally, and then next class will start. Unit nine and ten. Nine and ten, guys, I'll be doing together. Okay, that. Uh, so that is the thing that you can write here. Yes, I was discussing question number two. Okay, obstacles. Okay. Will there be twenty five econs? I say there'll be uh, for English medium. It won't be twenty five for English medium. It's it's half English, half singular. Right. Uh, guys, this is not econ only, right? It's all the subjects. So we're looking at around four or five econ, right? Four to five econ and stuff like that. Uh, will the exam be held in November? I don't know, but let's hope and pray it happens. Okay. Right. Uh, then we'll come into these guys. Okay. Define pure public. I'm not going to do that. It'll be a disgrace. Merit goods also. We looked at before, guys. What is a merit good and all of it? You can talk about. Uh, Common resources also, you can define, okay? Yes, go, when you're defining, go with the characteristics, right? This excludability rivalry, go with those. Don't cook up new answers from different times. Then, uh, yes, what is a natural monopoly? What is a natural monopoly? A monopoly that sells mm, agricultural products, nature-related products. What is a natural monopoly? Exactly. It's a firm that is dominating guys because of economies of scale. A natural monopoly is where a firm, right? They have become so big. Now they have economies of scale, meaning they are producing in very huge quantities, very large quantities. So you can't even compete with them because their cost is very, very low. That is what a natural monopoly is, right? A firm, a monopoly that is producing in very large scale and as a result, they're experiencing economies of scale, meaning their average cost of production is very low. So other people can't even come into the market because this guy is producing at a very low cost. They can't even come and compete. So it's naturally he has become a monopoly. That is what a natural monopoly 
Yes, right. You can take yes. Still on electric board also, you can take as an example. No problem. Okay. That story. That. Uh, then um, explain why taxes are necessary for a country and briefly outline the desirable properties of a tax system. Guys, now in simple terms, they are combining the two questions, right? In the 2016 paper, right, they ask you for objectives and they ask you for characteristics. Now here they are combining why are tax necessary? Talk about the objectives to earn government revenue, to minimize income disparity, to uh, control the consumption of demerit goods, right? So why is that necessary? The objectives of taxation. And then briefly outline the properties of a good tax system. Now here you can't just state, you can't just say equity. You can't just say convenience. You say equity in one or two lines, explain what is equity, right? You say convenience, okay, one or two lines, explain what is convenience. So the same question that we discussed in 2016, they're combining it and giving. But they want you to go a little bit more in detail. Okay, that's that question, so I'm not going to go into detail. Okay. And then uh, what is meant by the primary balance and why is it considered to be important to have a surplus in the primary balance? What do you all think? Okay, first of all, what is the primary account balance? How do we calculate this primary account balance? I would have taught you all this now. Primary account balance is what? It's total government revenue, including grants, minus total government revenue. Include. For some reason, this board is like, takes so long to type in this board. Hold on. Okay, so total government revenue, including Okay, that's why I copy base. Minus. Okay, so minus total expenditure. Fine. Including grants, right? Minus total ex expenditure, excluding interest payment. Nice. Grants are included there. It's interest payment that is excluded in from the revenue, from the expenditure. Sorry. Okay, that's primary account balance. So then on this case, okay, I'll show you the answer itself. Why is it considered important to have a surplus in this? So why is this, uh, what? Surplus important. Why should you have a primary account surplus? Okay, so this is the original marking scheme. On that end, hmm, okay, question number seven. No? Okay, here see now, when, even they say outline guys, now this, I would have, one mark for any two reasons. Mm, I want, when you say outline, I would have liked if you all have gone with a point rather than state. Okay, so, okay, you give the definition here, right? So remember for the definition that you gave, you get around two marks. So then why is it this thing, right? So one mark for any two reasons, right? So you need to give two reasons why it's important, why it's important to have a surplus. Look at the reasons that they've given. Please now trust me, these things, trust me, are copied and pasted from the internet. Okay, these are not the government being typing these. Okay, so the primary budget balance defined as the budget balance, uh, balance net interest, that, 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 that. Okay, so stabilizing the debt to GDP ratio and subsequently putting it on a declining path towards uh, the reference value is this, 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 this. Okay, uh, primary deficit shows the borrowing requirements of the government, including interest payment for meeting. Expenditure, if primary deficit is zero, then fiscal deficit is equal to interest payment. Then it is not adding to the existing loan. Okay, nice. Uh, primary balance is generally used as a basic measure of fiscal irresponsibility. It is said to provide an indicator of current fiscal effort. Okay, simple terms. I'll explain this point. This makes more sense for us, right? Now, if you look at uh, interest payments, guys. Now, interest payments are, we are, do, we are paying interest because of loans we took earlier, right? Now, let's say uh, in 2020, right? Let's say Gota became president, right? When Gota became president in 2020, right? Now, he will be paying interest for loans that they took 20, 30 years ago, right? So, what Mahinda took, what uh, Maitri took, what, you know, Chandrika took, all those loans, this guy will be paying interest, right? So, if you can, that because that interest is what came from previous. Now, he can't, he can't you know, he can't be held responsible for that. Right? Gota can't be held responsible. So in the primary account balance, 
you don't consider interest no right you don't take into interest into consideration so here we are saying is a basic measure of fiscal irresponsibility it can be said to provide an indicator of current fiscal current fiscal effort because why interest pay, payments are predetermined that's for previous things right so now if gota did well right then his primary account balance has to be a positive because interest payments right you can't blame him because that is because the previous fellow has played a joke but in primary account balance you don't take interest payments into account so that is an important factor so you only take revenue including grants minus the expenses without interest payment so for countries with a large outstanding public debt right achieving a primary surplus is normally viewed as important being usually necessary for a reduction in the debt to gdp ratio that's one context right it measures the discipline of your your have you been doing things properly and then okay if you have a primary account surplus means right so primary deficits show that borrowing requirements of the government including interest payments for meeting expenses so you are having a primary account deficit means you are kind of borrowing okay try to understand this in depth right now these points are not very basic right so it's government revenue right government revenue with interest payment excluding expenditure right so expenditure excluding right excluding interest now if you have a right listen carefully if you have a primary account surplus right now if this value is a surplus means with that year's income you can pay off that year's expenditure now because interest payment is not a that year expenditure it's because something previous people did so having a primary surplus means that year's expenditure that year's expenditure can be covered by that year's revenue but you're having a primary deficit means your that year's expenditure cannot even be covered by the that year's revenue because interest payment remember is not that year's right it's previous year's loans so that is why i say uh, see if this primary deficit is zero then fiscal deficit is equal to interest payment so then it does not add to existing loans but if your primary account is also a negative right you can't even cover your current uh, ex your day to day expenditure with your that year's revenue means you have to keep on borrowing so a little bit advanced points right okay yeah. yeah guys uh including government which one no so primary deficit shows the borrowing requirements of the government including interest payment for meeting expenditure so now the primary deficit right okay now let's say you got a deficit of 2000 yen right that deficit and then uh with interest payments you get the overall deficit that is the amount of money that you have to borrow right let's say interest payment is 1000 so primary deficit shows the borrowing requirement so you have to borrow this 2000 of required the government including interest payment so you have to borrow this also we have omitted this get it no to advance yeah so that's what they're telling you by the primary deficit you can find out how much you can borrow how much you should borrow that kind of thing is what they are saying you know this kind of question is a good question right a question that you all need to sit a little and understand you can't you know uh, you know memorize this and go and uh, write it on a paper so go through these guys now but i don't think it will be repeated again the same question will be repeated repeated but good questions to you know learn something from so please do go through that's 2019 okay then we have one last paper i think i should be able to finish it off the 2020 paper mm. hold on okay if you look at the 2020 paper how is the 2020 question was it easy hard I think twenty twenty was a very easy question. No? Mm. The only thing was this vote of account and appropriation, right? So then we come to the twenty twenty paper. Okay, here's the twenty twenty paper, right? The latest paper that you have. Yes, always remember that you are more likely to get a paper similar to twenty nineteen compared to twenty twenty. 
I'm not saying you're getting the exact 2019 questions, but it's more likely to be like a 2019 than a 2020. Okay, right. So state whether the following goods are pure public goods. Give reasons for your answers. Okay, uh, lighthouses, pure public or not? Yes, right. So you can say non-excludable, non-rival. Ocean fish, pure public or not? No, right? These are common resource, right? So there is rivalry. The internet, what do you think? Pure public or not? What can you tell about the internet? What do you all think? Yes or no? What can you say? Okay, first of all, internet, is there a rivalry? Is there a rivalry in the internet? Just because I'm using the internet, uh, does that mean you can't use? No, right? There is no rivalry. Rivalry is not there, right? Uh, do you have, can you exclude a person from using the internet? Yeah, so rival is always go with the features right so rivalry is not there excludability yes right you can exclude right if he doesn't pay and stuff so excludability is somewhat there so what kind of thing is this it's like a quasi public yes can you all see what, what does the answer scheme say does it say it doesn't say private right does it say private you can argue also there is rivalry. But can you let me know on what the, what the answer scheme says? Does it say, uh, are they arguing it on a different angle than what I am saying here? No, no, common resource is like the other way. No, common resources, there is rivalry, no excludability. Is anyone answer scheme? What is the answer scheme saying? On this, why are they saying it's not? Have they given a reason? Yeah, so then we can go with this, right? Now, these kind of things, right? So it's non rival, but it's excludable. So for it to be a public good, it has to have both, right? It has to be both. So this context, if you explain it now, no. you don't have to say, you don't have to go and say what type of good it is also, but you can say, okay, goods that are uh, non-rival and excludable can be considered as uh, quasi-public goods or semi-public goods. You can write, that's up to you, but in your point, they're only asking you, state whether are they public or this thing, and I give a reason. You don't have to say what good it is. You have to simply prove why it is not a public good. So go with your normal thing, guys. Remember all of these things, right? What type of good it is, you always go with the features, rivalry and excludability. Go with that feature. Okay, done. Uh, name two merit goods and explain why they are considered as merit goods. Okay, two merit goods. Education, okay, sanitary facilities, uh, healthcare, right? So provides, so vaccination, right? Uh, why are they merit? Okay, name two merit goods, so you get two marks. And why are they considered as merit goods? Because they give positive externalities in consumption, right? So there is an external benefit, right? There is a third party who is benefiting it in addition to the private benefit, right? Okay, hybrid, hybrid vehicles, totally fine. So put in that case, a very simple question. Then distinguish between appropriation bill and a vote and account. Now remember, last year was a year that they had an election. So during a year of election, right, they use things like this, an appropriation bill and vote on account and uh, stuff like that. This, what is the difference between this? What is an appropriation bill? What is an vote on account? What do you all think? Yes, an appropriation bill is a full budget, right? You, now, for example, you say uh, the appropriation bill uh, has been passed, right? That means the budget has been approved. That's a full budget, an appropriation. Uh, wait, am I explaining something wrong? No, right? Appropriation bill. 
Yeah, yeah, that's the full budget, right? So, appropriation bill is like the full budget. Now, when in a year of election and all of that, they will not have a appropriation bill. Now, this is what you know. The finance minister comes and reads out, guys, right? He comes and says, you know, our this 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 department, this this expenditure is there. This is but uh, this is the revenue. This is how we are going to find it. This is how we are going to uh, finance our deficit, right? That is what you call an appropriation bill. It shows everything, right? But then, what is a vote on account? What is this vote on account thing? The vote on account we say is usually in a see is a special provision given to the government to obtain vote of parliament to withdraw money when the budget for the new financial year is not released due to some unexpected event, right? Maybe elections is underway or something. Now preparing these budgets, guys, is not an easy thing. No? So let's say there is an election in March or February, right? In January, they will not make the entire appropriation bill. They will not be making the entire thing because useless. No, if a new president now a new president will come, uh, maybe same party, different party, he will have his own policies. So it's a waste of our time preparing a full one. But that does not mean during that time there is no expenditure. Because government can't just make expenditure, right? It has to be pre previously approved. So this vote on account is where you. Uh, you know, get approval for those expenditure, right? For those different, uh, what, for those months, let's say January, February, March, to get expenditure for those months. Now, a vote on account does not talk about uh, income and all of it, right? There is no income part of it. It's only talking about expenditure. And remember, vote on account and interim budget is different. Interim budget also speaks of uh, the revenue side of it but i don't think it will be a question this year because this is not a year that uh, has an election and all of it and also last year it has been questioned also right so the probability of it is less but that does not mean you completely skip it okay so that's simply this remember guys you have three things right one is the appropriation bill that is a full budget okay appropriation bill that's a full budget then you have a vote on account that is not a full budget. That is until maybe an uh, election or something happens just to get the expenditure out, to get approval. Then also you have something called an interim budget. Right? This interim budget is like, it's like a combination of these two. Right? It's for a short period. But it also has income expenditure both. Right? That's like an interim budget. So those concepts usually come when there is like an election kind of thing. Right? During the year. So I don't think it will be tested this year. So don't worry too much. Okay. Right. Uh, the last two questions for the day, and then we're done. What are the non-tax revenue sources of government in the recent years? Okay, these also, I think I gave you all in, it is there in the central bank report. And yeah, I remember I gave you all like an answer. Oh, am I talking about other bets? Okay, so charges and fees, profits and dividends. What else? Uh, fines, I think, right? Uh, interest and rent income, okay, right? I think I showed you all this, right? Uh, social security contributions. So yeah, lottery income, right? So you can put in different different uh things like that. Okay, so um, fertilizer is not an income income really, right? So you can go with uh sale of assets, right? Okay, fine. Then lottery income, okay, you can give that. Uh, what was that I missed? Oh, yeah, fines and licenses, yes. Mm, then there was, okay, social security contributions. Okay, so different, different things that you all can give, guys. Now, again, a question, now that is a question that has been come, has come in the past, right? So, go prepared. Done. Okay, and then the final one, again, a question that has been uh, repeated over and over again. Why does a free market overproduce a good with negative externality? So, can you see? Same question, right? You simply draw the negative externality diagram, right? You draw the diagram. I'm not going to draw the diagram again for you. So, show why it is overproduced, show that, you know, that uh, the private cost is less than the social cost. So the cost is kind of underestimated. So they, uh, they allocate more resources, that, 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 you know, that entire story with a diagram. So usually you get like two marks for a diagram 
and three marks for an explanation now if you look at it all these most of the years right almost three years the exact negative externality in production was asked in almost three years so the others were not asked much yeah the 2020 paper is comparatively easy guys now this vote on account but uh, thing is also not that hard right it's also a, a easy thing so comparatively this paper is easy meaning your question might be hard i don't know right i and i i won't guarantee you say that uh, your question is going to be hard it can be right okay it's not a guarantee saying that it is going to be hard and it's going to be this one no but it can be hard so because of that go prepare the properly but if you look at it guys trust me okay most of the questions that come come from past papers no right now if you look at this question which was the the only question that was not tested in past papers i think is this right the appropriation bit right uh, this one came whether you know state whether it is a uh, public or merit or that kind of question was there uh, about merit goods you had right distinguish between merit goods stuff like that there were questions like that uh, non tax revenue was also there okay and then this one was also there right negative externality over production the only thing that was not there was this right the appropriation bit see there is just one question newly that comes in all the other parts are there guys if you do your past paper properly and go right it's uh that is the story so don't worry too much right trust me the questions that you will get will not be complete new questions it will be questions that will come from past papers so go prepared right at least i'll say 60 70% or even more than that is direct past papers question in a little bit of a different way small percentage they might test newly so you need eight new things that i feel they can test one is the debt to gdp right on how uh it has increased much right uh, they can give you on what has happened to our revenue and expenditure revenue has fallen expenditure has increased right they can ask you measures what the government has done they can ask you fiscal policy measures uh, what the government has done due to covid 19 so those kind of new new things can come in right you would have spoken of in the fast track and the mock exams also so just keep that in mind right there are things like uh, that okay okay and small thing is now for the mock exam series next month not next month now this is october no? so the, i there can be new people who can join some around 5 6 people last month couldn't join because i closed registrations and they wanted to join but i uh ran out of tutes and all of it so last month i closed but this month i might print a little bit of a more tute i don't know depending on how the situation is so if you all want you all can join but i'll try and uh when will that happen probably next saturday is where we will do this month's stuff but i am not sure next saturday if i will be there in colombo so i am doubting but somehow if you all are registering try to register beforehand and keep because otherwise uh, you all will run, will run out of tutes i will not open registration i'll simply close it off okay so just uh, if any of you all are people there that is there so to register guys what you will have to do is uh, you have to make the monthly fee and then send me the slip if you want the details i'll uh let you know on uh, maybe i'll send it on the group or somewhere okay so that is it from me for unit number 8 i think we took around four classes we're done with the mcqs we're done with the essay questions and yeah this entire board is there with me but but remember things right so on your end all what i want you all to do is remember how things are going so we are done with this entire thing looks like different different islands in the sea for some reason uh so that's completely done and dusted on your end guys please go through right see what we have done make sure that you're completely uh, done with that econ seminar i might do one session might be the session that is on monday i'm thinking is any suggestions which one do you want to learn under me we have credit creation but i don't know if i can finish credit creation in 2 hours credit creation a few parts of national income accounting uh maximum prices minimum prices mm, then we had what else did we have uh, monetary policy tools which one do you all want to look at under me because i will only take one topic i can't take all the topics exchange rates credit creation gdp monetary policy tools okay we'll see i'm getting so many different different things <laughs> right 
<laughs> okay, so that's it for me for today, guys. I'll decide and I'll see whatever that uh, how the teachers also take and whatever I feel I can finish off in uh, two hours. We'll see. And we're done. See you all next class, next Saturday morning. We're starting unit number nine and 10. Please do the MCQs and come, okay? At least half of the years. MCQs come. We all know the process now, know how things go. So do at least half of the year and come and then we'll wrap things up. See you guys. Have a good, 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 good day. See you. Bye.